Did you know that according to the Bible, there's a city known spiritually as Babylon the Great, which is described as the dwelling place of demons, a habitation for every impure spirit, a cage for unclean and hateful birds, and a guardhouse for every detestable animal. This city has influenced nations around the world to indulge in the inflaming wine of her adultery. The kings of the earth have been lured into committing adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth have amassed wealth through the power of her luxuries. Revelation 17.5 clearly states, The name written on her forehead was a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. In this video, we'll delve into a revealing exploration of Revelation 17. We'll also uncover how the Whore of Babylon represents an evil world system that'll be controlled by the Antichrist before Jesus Christ's return to Earth. I urge you to pay close attention to this video, as it holds the power to inform and transform you through the revelations it offers. Beloved, I encourage you to watch this video until the very end, participate in the prayers, and receive the blessings for yourself, your family, and your friends. Furthermore, I kindly ask you to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share this message to help us reach a wider audience. By doing so, you're not only spreading the gospel, but also touching more lives and advancing the kingdom of God. Now, let's explore the origin of Babylon. How did Babylon come to be? According to biblical interpretations, Babylon is often regarded as the devil city because it perpetually opposes God and everything associated with him. The Bible depicts Babylon as a city that symbolizes apostasy, opposing God's redemptive plan to save humanity. In Genesis 10, 8-10, an intriguing story is told about a prominent figure named Nimrod, a skilled hunter and warrior. Nimrod is believed to be the founding father of Babylon. The name Nimrod means to rebel, and the ideologies upon which he built Babylon mirrored rebellion against anything representing God, which continues to be associated with Babylon throughout history. Any city that rebels against God is figuratively referred to as Babylon. The Old Testament recounts significant events in Babylon, such as the story of the Tower of Babel, where humans attempted to build a tower to reach the heavens. However, God intervened by destroying the tower and dispersing humanity causing them to speak different languages, thus hindering their ability to understand and communicate with each other. In contemporary terms, the word Babylon is used to signify any city that outrightly rejects the ways and laws of God. In Revelation 18, 1-3, it is emphatically stated that Babylon the Great has fallen and become a dwelling for demons and unpure spirits, a place for every unclean bird and detestable animal, the nations have indulged in her adulteries, and the kings and merchants have grown rich from her excessive luxuries. Even in ancient times, Babylon was renowned for its fervent idolatry, as evidenced in the story of Nebuchadnezzar and the three Hebrew boys, who refused to bow down to the golden image of the king and were consequently cast into the fiery furnace due to their unwavering faith in God. In the ancient city of Babylon, we find a stark contrast between it and the ways of God. A vivid example comes from the pages of the book of Daniel, where King Balthazar ordered the use of sacred golden vessels from the Jerusalem temple to serve wine during his extravagant gatherings. The holy vessels meant for worship were misused by the revelry, a departure from God's ways. Drawing parallels to our present era, we witness a similar trend in the world around us. Babylon's echoes resonate in our society today, reflecting a shift away from God's principles towards idolatry. Morality seems to be on the decline, and behaviors once considered detestable now becoming normalized. Nudity, crime, and promiscuity are on the rise, seemingly accepted as the norm in various societies. Now let's delve into Revelation 17 and compare its insights with the current global landscape Revelation 17, 1-2 describes a great prostitute with vast influence, leading many astray. It says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, 
I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. First, the Bible tells us of this figure, which symbolizes a pervasive force that will influence leaders, politicians, celebrities, and professionals across various domains, from religion and politics to economy, education, entertainment, media, and family. The scriptural portrayal hints at a spiritual adultery, akin to the ungodly religious systems we observe today. Influential figures, including celebrities and politicians, have succumbed to the allure of the metaphorical prostitute, abandoning their moral compass. This surrender to worldly values often leads them to openly embrace opposing beliefs without remorse. Some even proudly declare allegiance to opposing forces, promoting Babylon's values and systems. In our time, it's crucial to remain vigilant, recognizing the deceptive nature of such influences. Many influential figures have traded their spiritual well-being for the pursuit of worldly gains, openly embracing practices contrary to God's ways. As leaders publicly claim affiliations with opposing forces, engaging in lifestyles misaligned with God's principles, we must be attentive and discerning of the times. By understanding these parallels, we equip ourselves to navigate the challenges of our modern Babylon, holding steadfast to the teachings of the Bible. Secondly, Revelation 17, 4-5 says, The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and the abominations of the earth. Friends, like King Nebuchadnezzar's desire to build a name for himself, as mentioned in Daniel 3, the modern world system is also inclined towards this ancient practice of idolizing personal reputation. Today, success is often narrowly defined by worldly achievements and broken records, rather than viewed through the lens of God's Word. This shift has led to intense competition and a widespread focus on self-promotion, mirroring the ambitions of the ancient Babylonians. There's a fascinating account in Genesis 11.4. Picture this, a group of people united by a common goal set out to build not just any city, but a colossal one. Their ambition soared even higher with the construction of a towering monument that aimed to touch the very heavens. It wasn't merely about bricks and mortar. It symbolized a profound desire to carve out their identity into the pages of history, reaching for a kind of glory that went beyond the limits of mortal existence. This ambitious project wasn't just a physical undertaking. It represented a deep-seated aspiration for recognition and distinction. The story paints a vivid picture of humanity's unwavering pursuit of acknowledgement and fame, reflecting an intrinsic yearning for significance. It captures a timeless essence, the human quest for leaving a mark, for being remembered, and for standing out in a crowd. Additionally, Revelation 17.4 warns of a corrupt entity wielding influence through immorality and abominable practices, indicating a deliberate effort to lead people astray and erode their faith. The prevalence of promiscuity, nudity, sexual perversion, and immorality in contemporary society aligns with this warning. As these behaviors are intended to draw individuals away from God and towards spiritual destruction, the normalization of activities such as changing one's gender, public nudity, extramarital relations, and even bestiality in some regions contradict the principles set forth by God, reflecting a deliberate promotion of values contrary to His teachings. All these are the embrace of the Babylonian system. Please remember that Scripture consistently equates fornication and adultery with idolatry and false religion emphasizing the spiritual consequences of such behaviors. This parallels the historical references in the books of God's prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Hosea, where Israel's infidelity to God was likened to marital unfaithfulness. 
Therefore, as believers in the present age, I want you to know that we're at a critical juncture between historical precedent and prophetic warnings. It is incumbent upon us to defend the faith entrusted to us, remaining vigilant against the pervasive influences of idolatry and false religion propagated by the spirit of Babylon. In conclusion, dear brothers and sisters, I implore you to steadfastly uphold your faith and remain vigilant in discerning these subtle yet potent signs of Babylon's influence. The allure of Babylon's strategies is undeniably real, ensnaring many through its cunning methods, leading them into a perilous rebellion against God. It is paramount that you fortify your commitment to serving God, unwavering in your resolve and resolute in your faith. Embrace an unyielding stance, firmly rooted in your convictions, and heed the admonition found in 1 Timothy 4, 1-2, where it's said, the Spirit explicitly states that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Such teachings are propagated by hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. As we navigate these precarious times, let's not underestimate the gravity of these warnings. Instead, let us stand firm, equipped with unwavering faith and an unshakable dedication to the truth thereby safeguarding ourselves against the insidious influences of deception and falsehood. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I express my profound gratitude for you unveiling the mysteries of Babylon to me today. As I now perceive your desire for my unwavering devotion to serve you and you alone, I humbly seek forgiveness for any instances where I have strayed after false gods. I beseech your pardon and cleansing that I may be made whole in your name. Amen. Dear Father, we implore your abundant grace to shield us from the snares of deception and the seduction that permeates the last days. Amidst the intricate web of wicked strategies, we entreat your divine protection, cradled within your loving embrace. Deliver us from the sinister schemes that abound in these final days and fortify us to stand resolute in faith until the very end. We earnestly beseech and declare that you will endow us with the grace to steadfastly uphold your name amidst the tribulations and persecutions that accompany the last days. May we as pilgrims on this earthly journey be found blameless before your righteous throne at the end of our sojourn here. Now, Lord, we proclaim that the blessings of this prayer encompass all our brothers and sisters around the world praying with us and those who will partake in these prayers later. We thank you, Lord, for the unwavering confidence we have in your ever-attentive ear to our supplications. With hearts full of thanksgiving, we present our prayers. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. If this video has blessed you, Please take a moment to share it with your family, friends, or loved ones who need this message in their lives. The world is ready for the Antichrist. It might sound terrifying to some, or be dismissed as religious fiction by others. But whatever your initial reaction, I urge you to settle in and join me for this video about how the world is prepared for the Antichrist. But before we dive in, let's take a trip back to the beginning of time. God created Adam and Eve and provided everything they needed for a wonderful life. God also gave them instructions to navigate their existence in the Garden of Eden. It's like when you buy a new electronic and it comes with a manual. This manual isn't there because you have no idea how to use the appliance. It's to fully utilize it. So, God gave the first man and woman instructions, but sadly, they were deceived by Satan into disobeying God, leading to their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. As a result, not only did they lose their place in Eden, but they also lost their place in God's heart. The single act of disobedience created a significant divide between God and humanity. Along with the chaos caused by their disobedience, humans became vulnerable to sin and its dire consequence, death. Humans became constantly exposed to evil. What a fate! Cain committed the first murder by killing his brother Abel. Prior to this, Cain had never known the act of murder, but sin had now fully entered the world. Following this, 
The world has witnessed various forms of evil. For example, Pharaoh ordered the brutal murder of young babies in Goshen, while Herod did the same at the birth of Jesus. However, the truth is that the world has not yet seen anything like the evil that the Antichrist will unleash in the last days. The Antichrist will represent the pinnacle of evil, the greatest embodiment of wickedness that will be revealed during the Great Tribulation. In biblical eschatology, it is believed that the Antichrist will represent the ultimate embodiment of rebellion against Christ. A man will emerge to oppose Christ and his followers more vehemently than anyone in history. He will falsely claim to be the true Messiah, seeking to dominate the world and eradicate all followers of Jesus Christ and the nation of Israel. The prophet Daniel, many years ago, prophesied about the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the said times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. The Bible also captures the Antichrist's atrocious acts in Revelation chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. People worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So, the beast will wield authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. That's an unprecedented level of influence, unlike any human king or ruler throughout history. How is this level of influence possible? It's simple. He will be given authority by Satan, who is known as the dragon. Remember, Satan attempted to tempt and destroy Christ by offering him all the kingdoms of the world, but Christ rejected that offer. However, at the end of this age, Satan will find someone who will accept it. As the end of this age approaches, people will become worshipers of Satan. One reason for this is that they will believe that Satan and the beast have achieved a final victory over God and his people. Satan has always craved worship, and in the end, some will give it to him. Worship of Satan and the Antichrist will become more widespread and open as the beast gains global power, with no country or military force able to oppose him. These are the events that will characterize the Great Tribulation. The beast will oppress the saints, but at the same time, they will triumph over him. The Antichrist may physically overcome them, but they will overcome him in the most important way, spiritually. Even as he tortures or kills them, they will remain victorious. Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and, standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast in its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given them by God. Now, let me bring your attention to the fact that the world is ready for the Antichrist. This isn't clickbait, but it is a fact that we can acknowledge through the Bible. For instance, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2-3 through 3 says, This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Now, you see how the scripture reveals that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. The spirit that will empower the Antichrist is already in the world. The Bible tells us that the simple way to recognize the spirit is to pay attention to this detail. Does it acknowledge that Jesus is from God or not? Simple, right? Yes, but that isn't all there is to it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. The spirit of the Antichrist will never openly say or admit that Jesus Christ was God who came to the earth in the flesh. 
This is one simple feature you'll notice in people under this Spirit's influence, including self-acclaimed ministers of the gospel. They will never preach the truth expressed in scriptures, such as John chapter 1, verse 14, which says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The tricky thing is that even though they won't only admit this truth, they will also try to avoid being in a situation requiring them to openly deny it. But by their failure to acknowledge it, they show they do not believe it. Deceivers and false teachers can be recognized by what they do not say as well as by what they do say. Always remember this. The spirit of the Antichrist can be recognized by the things they say and do not say, the things they stand for and do not stand for, as well as the things they associate with and do not associate with. When it comes to this, there is no middle ground. It is either you are for Christ or the Antichrist. This is why people who do not have a stand cannot be trusted when it comes to matters of allegiance to the faith. Today, many people, institutions, and organizations are unknowingly influenced by the spirit of the Antichrist. This influence is evident in their decisions, attitudes, and stance on matters of faith. When people are quick to dismiss or remain neutral about matters related to their faith in Christ, it reveals the spirit influencing their actions. A genuine Christian will not speak disparagingly about the things of Christ. A true follower of Christ will not remain neutral about anything associated with Jesus Christ and His kingdom. When someone does, it's a subtle indication that the person is already under the manipulative influence of the Antichrist. When people, systems, nations, or governments start trading Christian values and morals for cultures that promote decadence, it's a clear sign that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. Many nations today are comfortable removing the Bible from schools, yet they are quick to legalize abortions, endorse same-sex marriages, and embrace diverse sexual orientations in the name of liberty and freedom. These are all covert schemes to pave the way for the rule of the Antichrist in the world today. Even though many may not be aware, these realities remain unchanged. One of the signs of the end times that Jesus told his disciples about is the emergence of false messiahs, Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 5. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. In this scripture, Jesus clearly warns about the prevalence of deception and false messiahs in the last days. The rise of false messiahs and prophets in our world today indicates the readiness for the Antichrist. While the Antichrist has not yet been revealed, the devil is already at work through these false prophets. These individuals are persuasive, but their gospel lacks the power to save and inspire reverence for God. Some lead large congregations and have substantial online followings, presenting an impressive facade for their Sunday worship services. However, they are like wolves in sheep's clothing, with intentions aligned with the devil's to steal, kill, and destroy. They masquerade themselves as pastors and teachers, but in truth, they are very far from God. They are ferocious and ravenous wolves that are ready to devour. Unlike a true pastor who tends and feeds the flock, these ones devour and destroy the flock. They are not after the gospel. Their messages lack conviction without any mention of repentance, the Holy Spirit, or hell. These are signs of false prophets. They are out to simply devour and destroy like their master, the devil. We have been warned to be careful of false prophets who pretend to be sheep but are in truth dangerous wolves. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 9 through 10 says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Friends. We must not give room to the devil. Satan can take the slightest opportunity and maximize it to his advantage. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with exactly how Satan works, deception. Currently, some of the deceptions in the world are under the disguise of false religion. Any religion, regardless of how popular it is, that does not acknowledge Jesus as the one way to the Father is already falsehood. There is no better definition of deception than this. Satan will go to any length to deceive people. His strategy hasn't changed. It remains to steal. 
and kill and destroy. But praise God, Jesus says he came so that we may have life abundantly. So, while the Antichrist has yet to be revealed, we must be careful not to be tossed into deception. False prophets are on the rise and are doing everything necessary to sway people. But Jesus already warned us about this. Finally, we must be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. We should not automatically embrace the message of any preacher or teacher simply because of their reputation or credentials. Rather, we must listen cautiously to their Christology. What they say about Jesus is of utmost importance. What if I told you that wars and rumors of wars aren't the primary signs of the end times? I bet that might challenge what you've believed for quite some time. It's no surprise, considering how most media outlets tend to highlight wars and rumors of wars as the main indicators that the world is nearing its end. Whenever conflict erupts, particularly in regions like Israel or the Middle East, the media often stirs up fear, linking it to the end of days. But the video you're about to watch is about to shake up those long-held beliefs. It'll make you question whether the signs Jesus spoke about are actually enough to predict the end times. You may discover that there's much more to it than you ever imagined. I invite you to journey with me in this video as we unravel together holistically what the Bible truly defines as the signs to look out for in the last days before the return of the Son of Man. Feeling intrigued? That's the spirit. Let's dive deeper into this together. On March 13, a prominent global news agency reported President Vladimir Putin's alarming statement to the West. Russia was technically prepared for nuclear war. Putin warned that any U.S. deployment of troops to Ukraine would escalate the conflict significantly. In a similar vein, on March 15, French President Emmanuel Macron responded assertively to Putin's nuclear threats, affirming France's nuclear capabilities and readiness for any scenario. But the headlines don't stop there. What's even more startling is the recent surge in underground bunker construction by some of the world's wealthiest individuals, preparing for what they term as doomsday. From Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal, to Mark Zuckerberg, and most recently Elon Musk, numerous billionaires have reportedly built underground bunkers as a precaution against potential catastrophe. What should we make of these kinds of news headlines? When we encounter such news, it's natural for some to feel anxious or fearful about the future. However, as Christians, how should we respond to these developments? Everywhere you look, news outlets are abuzz with reports of conflicts and turmoil among nations worldwide. It seems there's always talk of wars and unrest, shaking the very foundations of our world. But did you know that the Bible actually foretells these events as signs of the last days? So the question begs, should we view wars and rumors of wars as the foremost indicators of the end? Just before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, his disciples approached him with a question that had likely been weighing heavily on their hearts. Much like us, they were curious about the signs of the last days. So one day, while Jesus was seated on the Mount of Olives, his disciples sought him out privately and posed the timeless question, when will all this happen? And what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Matthew 24, verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? If you pay close attention, you'll see that the disciples actually asked Jesus three questions at once. First, they asked him to tell us. Then they inquired about, when will this happen? And finally, they asked about the sign of your coming. Jesus, recognizing the sincerity of their hearts and their need for clarity on these important matters, wasted no time in addressing all three questions. In Matthew 24, verses 4 to 8, Jesus begins by warning them. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. 
Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. What's intriguing is that the very first sign Jesus mentions isn't about war or conflict, it's about deception. Deception, my friend, is the primary sign believers must be wary of in the last days. The scripture makes it clear that when discussing signs of the end times, deception should be our foremost concern. If every Christian takes this warning about the last days seriously, then fewer will fall prey to the deceit of false prophets and messiahs. Jesus understood how even the most steadfast believers could be led astray, emphasizing the need for vigilant guard against deception in these end times. Deception is a potent weapon wielded by the enemy, my friend, and we must be on high alert. Next, Jesus mentions wars and rumors of wars as another sign of the end times. But before we delve into this, let's consider that wars have been a constant in human history and likely will continue. Since ancient times, conflicts have plagued the world. Take, for example, the battles fought by the children of Israel, both before and after they reached the Promised Land. In Exodus 17, Israel faced off against Amalek at Rephidim. Moses instructed Joshua to lead men into battle against Amalek, while he, along with Aaron and Hur, ascended a hill. Moses held up his staff, and as long as it was raised, Israel prevailed. However, when Moses grew weary and lowered his hands, Amalek gained the upper hand. To ensure Moses could maintain his stance, Aaron and Hur supported his arms until sunset, enabling Joshua to defeat Amalek and their forces. In Judges chapter 7, Israel faced another battle, this time against the Midianites. Gideon, leading an army of 32,000 men, remarkably reduced his forces to just 300 soldiers at God's command. With this small band, Gideon employed unconventional tactics, including trumpets, torches, and breaking jars to defeat the Midianites. One of Israel's significant battles was against the Philistines, resulting in heavy losses. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, we see Israel confronted by the Philistines at Ebenezer. Despite their efforts, Israel suffered defeat with about 4,000 soldiers falling in battle. 1 Samuel 4, verses 1 to 3, And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, so that He may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Seeking divine intervention, the elders of Israel decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the fray, believing it would secure victory. However, their hopes were dashed when the Philistines not only defeated them again, but also captured the ark and inflicted heavy casualties, losing about 30,000 foot soldiers. This story highlights that while the Israelites faced defeats in some battles, victory wasn't always immediate. Despite setbacks, they ultimately triumphed, demonstrating that their ultimate victory lay beyond the immediate outcome of any single conflict. Jesus talked a lot about things to keep an eye on as signs that the end times are coming, like deception, Wars, disputes between countries, disasters such as hunger, earthquakes, diseases, and people being mistreated because of what they believe. But Jesus said this is just the start of tough times, like the beginning of birth pains. So what should we be on the lookout for next? According to what the Bible eschatology, there are some big wars that'll happen before Jesus comes back. Bible scholars have different ideas about when these wars will happen. Some say before the tribulation, some say in the middle of the really tough times, and others say right before the end of everything. One of the most talked about events in this whole deal is the battle of Gog and Magog, which Ezekiel talks about in chapter 38 of the Bible. It's a big deal because it's supposed to happen near the end of the world. 
The Battle of Gog and Magog is prophesied apocalyptic battle that's supposed to happen before everything wraps up. It's like the final showdown between good and evil. Gog and Magog are thought to be nations or groups of people who will try to fight against God's followers, but will end up losing in the end. Ezekiel 38 verses 18 and 22. This is what will happen in that day. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the Sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground, and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment on him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him, and on his troops, and on the many nations with him. In the last days, Gog's attempt to attack God's people will be stopped by the Lord, who will wipe out the invaders using his divine power. After this showdown, the next big event according to the Bible is the War of Armageddon. As the tribulation nears its end, there will be a terrifying conflict called the Battle of Armageddon. The Bible predicts that evil spirits will influence the leaders of the world to gather their armies for a massive fight against Jerusalem. The Antichrist and his followers will battle against God's people. But then something incredible will happen. Jesus Christ will return to the earth with the heavenly armies, landing on the Mount of Olives. He'll defeat the evil forces and toss the Antichrist and the false prophet into a fiery pit. Satan will be put in chains, and Jesus will set up his kingdom on earth for 1,000 years. John, the beloved disciple, gives us a detailed account of all this in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 verses 11 to 15. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. John the Beloved further goes on to tell us what this vision fully entails. Revelation 19, 19 to 21. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed by the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. In the ultimate end of days, Jesus will triumph over all his enemies, including those who oppose his people. But what should we take away from these wars? Surprisingly, wars and rumors of wars aren't the main signs of the end times, according to Jesus. He's more concerned about the widespread deceit that will occur. Instead of fixating solely on wars and rumors, let's also pay attention to the rise of deception as a sign of the last days. We shouldn't let fear grip us because of headlines or rumors of wars spreading across the world. Jesus already assured us that no matter what happens, God's children will be shielded from harm in any battle. Rather than focusing on just one sign, we should heed all the signs that Jesus warned us about. Blessings Did you know that many people are unknowingly worshipping a new kind of God nowadays? This new religion is spreading all over the world, from Europe to North and South America to Asia and Africa. 
it's becoming the norm for many people. But the Bible warned us about this kind of behavior. This new religion, which is based on the worship of oneself, has been around for many years, even before most of today's religions. It goes against the commandments in the Old Testament, which tell us not to worship any other gods but the one true God. Jesus also emphasized this by saying we should love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. The Bible predicted this would happen in Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 12. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. In today's video, I will be sharing something important about this new God and how it's affecting many people today. I believe you'll find the revelation about this new God and its influence very meaningful. I encourage you to watch this video to the end. Join in the prayers and receive the blessings for yourself, your family, and your friends. Before we begin, please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share this content at least once to help us reach more people. By doing this, you're helping us spread the gospel, touch more lives, and advance the kingdom of God here on earth. Today, we are living in a world that's incredibly fascinating due to the vast increase in knowledge. It seems that this quest for knowledge will never cease as long as life exists on earth. This all began at the very start when our greatest adversary tricked Adam and Eve into rebelling against God by convincing them to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. This deception stands as one of the most significant in human history, with its effects still being felt by every person today. According to the book of Genesis, when they both ate from the fruit, their eyes were opened and they became aware of their nakedness. This marked the beginning of humanity's disobedience. The single act severed the connection between humanity and God, making humanity subject to their greatest adversary, Satan. But let me ask, who is Satan? Is he the terrifying, dark, and monstrous figure often depicted in stories and art? The answer is no. Contrary to popular belief, in the book of Ezekiel, the Bible describes Satan as a beautiful and wise being who held the high position in the heavens until pride led to his expulsion to the earth. This portrayal challenges the traditional image of Satan, shedding light on the complexity of this enigmatic figure. The ongoing struggle between Satan and humanity has persisted since the beginning of time, with humanity seemingly helpless in the face of his influence until Jesus' arrival. This altered the course of this age-old conflict, offering hope to humanity. But how does Satan deceive people today? It's a question that many people are hesitant to address. If anyone were to imagine being Satan, would they openly declare their intentions to deceive people and lead them to hell? Certainly not. In reality, no one would openly reveal such a sinister goal, recognizing that it would be ineffective. Similarly, many people today are reluctant to acknowledge the devil's cunning nature. You see, dear saints, Satan strives to divert worship away from God Almighty. Whether it's directing worship towards objects such as stones, toys, cars, pets, or anything else, as long as the focus shifts from God, Satan is content. He takes pride in steering people away from their devotion to God. This subtle approach allows him to influence individuals without them realizing his manipulative tactics. So, what exactly is the new God? It's a belief system that preaches and upholds the idea that you are your own God. It revolves around the concept of me, myself, and I, essentially worshiping oneself. Take a moment to reflect and ask yourself, is there anything inherently wrong with valuing oneself? Truthfully, there's nothing wrong with having positive self-esteem. However, the challenge arises when the line blurs between self-appreciation self-deification and self-worship. While you are a creation of God, if you begin to elevate and worship yourself, you essentially become your own deity. Let's take a moment to delve into this concept of the new God self. What does self really mean? According to the Bible, self is described as living under the control of the flesh, equating to living in sin. 
If you act in accordance with your fleshly desires, you are living under a carnal nature which is spiritually dead, as mentioned in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Addressing this, Jesus instructed his disciples on the path to becoming true and genuine followers in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, stating, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus clearly stated that to be his disciple, one must renounce self, carry their cross daily, and follow him. In today's world, the ideology of self has become prevalent. Self is glorified, promoted, and elevated to extreme levels. People have reached a point where they believe that everything revolves around them. While this may not seem inherently problematic initially, it has subtly led to the emergence of modern terms such as self-centeredness, self-respect, self-realization, and selfie. The language of the new God is centered on me, myself, and I, reminiscent of the arrogance depicted by the devil in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Contrary to contemporary teachings, the Christian life emphasizes being dead to self. It requires a distinct attitude toward self and one's newfound faith. These are two divergent paths that can never converge. The correct approach towards self is that it deserves to be forsaken, while Christ demands our unwavering daily devotion. This should be the perspective of every sincere follower of Christ. As the Apostle Paul stated in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's essential for believers to recognize that Satan is adept at manipulating people, recognizing that individuals hold reverence for God and are averse to disobeying him. Satan devised a cunning strategy. Instead of luring people into worshiping idols and alternative religions, he enticed them with the appealing notion of self-worship. This plan seems to be remarkably successful in today's world. In today's world, celebrities, influencers, politicians, and professionals from various fields often advocate for concepts like self-love, self-actualization, self-esteem, and self-realization. It's no surprise that the prevailing trends seem to revolve around the religion of self, positioning everything to cater to the individual. When people argue against the existence of God, they often raise questions such as, why did God allow my parents to die? Or, why did my father abuse me? These genuine questions stem from a self-centered perspective, as individuals question their own suffering and experiences. The Bible addresses this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, warning that people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. This is why many are told that they don't need God, as they themselves are considered the new gods. In today's digital age, social media significantly influences our lives. People showcase their achievements, new jobs, homes, spouses, and children to exalt themselves, not to give glory to God. The focus is on self-glorification, leading to a lack of transparency regarding life's challenges. Failures, rejections, and setbacks are rarely shared on social media because they do not align with the glorification of the new God self. The danger of the self-centered mindset lies in its opposition to a spiritual life in Christ. Living to elevate one's own desires is contrary to glorifying God, ultimately leading to separation from Him akin to other forms of sin. My dear friend, I'm so glad you've stuck around to watch this video up to this point. 
I want you to know that letting go of self-centeredness, dying to self, is a crucial step in allowing the spiritual life, the life of God, to take full effect in your life. Living solely for yourself goes against the plans and purposes that God has for you. In Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it's mentioned that through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. This highlights the freedom and life that comes from embracing the spiritual path. Let's reflect on the story of the rich young ruler in Luke 18. This young man asked Jesus what he needed to do to gain eternal life and go to heaven. Seeing he kept all the commandments from an early age, Jesus told him he still lacked one thing and advised him to follow the commandments, but then instructed him to sell his possessions, give to the poor, and follow him. However, the young man, being attached to his wealth, couldn't comply. He was very sad, and he turned around and left. The Bible does not say anything else about him after that day. Similar to the rich young ruler, many of us are rich in the new religion of self. To truly follow Jesus, we must be willing to let go of worldly attachments and follow him wholeheartedly. This is crucial to avoid falling into the trap of self-centeredness. Now, let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love and mercy in my life and the lives of my family, friends, and loved ones. Today, I ask that you help me rid myself of self-centeredness and live to glorify you alone. Please cleanse me of pride and arrogance and make me whole. Lord, we seek your grace to let go of self, to die to it each day, and to glorify Jesus in our lives. We also pray for those watching this video, present and future, that they may not be misled by the deception of self-centeredness. We ask for the grace to live for you and your kingdom's purposes alone. We declare that the blessings of this prayer extend to all our viewers, their families, and their loved ones in Jesus' name. What if I told you that the church, a place often associated with holiness and divine worship, could be infiltrated by witchcraft? This might be perplexing, but there are instances where the church becomes a breeding ground for witches and their craft. This phenomenon has left both new converts and longtime churchgoers questioning why such occurrences take place. Many people have left different churches because of various problems. And I'm not going to mince words. Situations like what we're about to see today have made many wonder what's wrong with the church. In our Christian communities, there are things happening nowadays that we wouldn't expect to see among followers of Jesus. I fondly recall a time when non-believers would attend church and leave profoundly touched by the palpable presence of God's power. Now you might be thinking that God's power has left the church. Not at all. Jesus told his followers that he would build his church and nothing, not even the power of hell, could destroy it. This reassurance implies that despite challenges, the divine influence within the church remains steadfast. In one of our previous videos, we talked about signs of witchcraft in your life. However, in this video, I will be sharing with you five important signs of witchcraft in your church and how you can overcome it and have victory over its influence in your life. I really consider you to be blessed for watching this video. Before we jump into it, let's take a moment to see what the Bible says about witchcraft. The Bible has always been clear about its stance on witchcraft. God strongly opposes any form of witchcraft. He doesn't and will never support witches or their activities in any way. You can see this in the instructions God gave to the Israelites about practicing witchcraft in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 13. God said, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you. In fact, Exodus 22:18 leaves no room for ambiguity, stating that witches should not be allowed to live. Now, armed with this biblical foundation, let's explore the signs that may indicate the presence of witchcraft within your local church. 
The first sign, gossip and betrayal. This is one of the sneakiest forms of witchcraft in the church. This subtle form of witchcraft often lurks within the church, concealing its presence like a sly fox in the night. It's often hard to spot because it seems harmless. When you visit a local church and notice gossip and betrayal amongst members, you might want to think twice before fully committing to that church. The body of Christ is more than just a social group. It's a spiritual family where members' needs are met and their interests are protected. In a healthy church, Christ's love should bind its members together as a unified force, transcending differences in status, education, age, and ethnicity. However, when there's gossip and betrayal among members, the devil and his cohort rejoice, sowing seeds of division within the body. Shockingly, some churches today grapple with divisions spawned by gossip reaching the extent of members betraying one another, which is an unmistakable mark of witchcraft manipulation. Beloved, gossip and betrayal have no place among believers. Instead, we should be showing perfect love for one another. That's why Jesus told us in John 13, 34 through 35, I give you a new command, love each other. You must love each other as I have loved you, all people will know that you are my followers if you love each other. Now, let's journey to the next sign that unveils whether your church is under the influence of witchcraft. The second sign, domineering leadership. What exactly does domineering leadership mean in the context of church and witchcraft manipulation? Well, it's any form of leadership that loves to pull the strings, aiming to manipulate and control every aspect of your life. This leadership style thrives on instilling fear in your mind and elevating human authority above the Holy Spirit. Some churches employ manipulative tactics to extort control over their members. They may even threaten you with curses or claim that leaving their church will lead you to hell. They might prevent you from visiting other Bible-believing churches. In extreme cases, they seek to make you a virtual slave to their dictates, resembling more of a cult than a true church. The spirit behind such manipulation is far from being the Holy Spirit. In these churches, leaders or pastors often show little concern for fostering your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are less interested in guiding you to listen and yield to the Holy Spirit's voice. If you find yourself in such a church, it's a clear sign of witchcraft. As Christians, we are called to a life of freedom, using that freedom to serve one another in love not to indulge in selfish desires. In Deuteronomy 10, 8, God instructed the priests to bless the people and not curse them. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister and to pronounce blessings in His name. They are to this day. Any place where people are subjected to curses or manipulated into obeying laws of the local church over God's word and spirit is a glaring sign of witchcraft. The third sign, idolatry and worship of images. A significant indicator to spot the workings of witchcraft in a church is the presence of idolatry and the worship of images or objects. Imagine this scenario. If you find yourself in a church where they hand you items to stash in your home or a car for supposed protection, it might be time to question the spiritual authenticity of that church. A genuine spiritual congregation encourages you to deepen your understanding of God. In these churches, they elevate things above Jesus. My dear friend, anything that takes the place of God in a church is essentially disguised idolatry. Sadly, many churches worldwide have drifted into this territory, swapping Jesus for rituals, traditions, and an array of images. Some even take it a step further, doling out pastor images, rings, holy water, and various religious trinkets, substituting them for genuine fellowship with the Lord. There are instances where people are taught to pray in the name of their pastors rather than in Jesus' name. These practices starkly contradict the teachings of biblical Christianity. Anything that hijacks our connection with Jesus is indeed an adversary. This is precisely what this witchcraft aims to achieve within the church. 
slyly replacing the centrality of Jesus with mere symbols and objects. The fourth sign, false prophets. The presence of false prophets is another sign that confirms witchcraft in a church. But who exactly is a false prophet? A false prophet is someone who claims to speak for God when God hasn't sent or approved them. They might say that they have a message from God for you, but in reality, God didn't tell them anything about you. They just make up lies to keep you under their control. What's intriguing about these false prophets is that they often are incredibly charismatic and persuasive, making it hard to see through their deception without spiritual discernment. But despite their charisma, it's easy to recognize a false prophet by following Christ's teachings. Jesus emphasized that you can know them by their fruits. Remember, the Bible teaches that there's no other name under heaven by which you can be saved and no other way to be saved except through Christ Jesus. So, just because someone speaks eloquently doesn't mean they're from God. The true test is not their eloquence, but in the spirit behind their words. 1 John 4, 1 through 3 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. This brings us to the last, but certainly not least, sign of witchcraft in your church. The fifth sign, suppression of spiritual gifts. It's crucial to recognize the signs of suppressing or ignoring spiritual gifts within a congregation, as this could indicate witchcraft. Sometimes someone in a church may have a special spiritual gift, but instead of nurturing and supporting it for the benefit of the church, leaders may start opposing it. This might be because they feel envious, fearing that the person's gifts will overshadow their own. Sadly, this behavior is a kind of witchcraft, as the enemy dislikes those who show spiritual gifts. Consider this scenario. If someone possesses the gift of healing, the enemy might manipulate others to silence or even drive them away from the church. They may employ teachings rooted in jealousy, downplaying the power of God to heal. It's like a subtle warfare against the manifestation of God's power through spiritual gifts. Remember, dear saints, it's crucial not to neglect the gifts that God has bestowed upon us. We should continue to use them for His glory, aligning with the wisdom shared in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, which emphasizes, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Saints, our gifts are meant to contribute to the greater well-being of the church and glorify God, not to be suppressed or undermined by jealousy and rivalry. Now, if you find yourself in a church influenced by manipulative witchcraft, you might wonder whether to leave for another church or stop attending altogether. But here are some ways to approach the situation. First, if you notice these activities in your church, take it to the Lord in prayer to understand His will for you. Also, confide in trusted believers who are not under this influence. Sometimes God may lead you to join another Bible-believing church, while at other times, He may want you to stay and help bring about a spiritual renewal. This is why prayer, seeking God's guidance, and using wisdom are crucial. For instance, if there are clear signs of idolatry and falsehood, God may prompt you to leave swiftly for your own well-being. However, if the issues are less obvious, like betrayal and gossip, God may want you to stay and be an agent of positive change there. In any decision, God will not lead you to isolate yourself completely from other believers. It's important to remember that witchcraft can manifest within the church, and we must be attentive to those signs in our local assembly. We should take necessary steps to overcome the influence of witchcraft and help others who may be affected by it. Beloved, the church is meant to be a place of love and truth. And to achieve this, we must expose and address any witchcraft that may hinder the true presence of God among His people during worship.